Hi, um, I am Deborah Heisch from Smith College. I'm an instructional technologist. And my name is Yasmin Eisenhower, also instructional technologist from Smith. So thanks for um, listening to our presentation today. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about our work at Smith and our approach. Um, we're first going to talk a little bit about a study that we did about faculty technologies. Um, and then we're going to talk about how that study led to the framework that we developed. Um, and then we're going to show a couple of user stories. From the kind of um, how many people are familiar with the tech adoption spectrum? A few of you. OK, great. So um, I'm bringing this up here uh, mostly because this is kind of what inspired our study. Um, and we sort of have a poll here in case you're interested in doing it. We can look at it at the end if you want to place yourself on that spectrum. Um, this spectrum is actually based on an old sociological model from the late 50s that looked at the adoption of farming techniques. Um, but it has become <laughs> widely used in the ed tech field to talk about adoption of technology in general. Um, and so um, it's interesting. It, we actually don't use the word laggards when we use it. We probably kind of didn't go over so well. Um, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> Um, so I kind of wanted to show that just at the beginning because we're going to be talking about that spectrum. Um, when I first got to Smith uh, about three and a half years ago, the instructional technology position did not exist. And so there were a lot of anecdotes about faculty technologies on campus, but we didn't have a lot of data about what actually was happening. Um, and Yasmin joined me soon after, about six months after I got there. Um, and so the, one of the first things that we wanted to do uh, was look at um, kind of what that landscape was. And we kept hearing like, oh, so-and-so is a high adopter, oh, so-and-so is an innovator, or so-and-so is a mid-adopter. And sort of these, de these categories about faculty, oh, you should work with the mid-adopters on this because they can handle this, and you should work with the innovators on this with this tool because they, they're going to be interested in that. Um, and so I'm an anthropologist <laughs> by training. And so mm -hmm. I sort of had this initial kind of resistance to that sort of very linear way of placing people. Um, and so that's kind of how this study came about. The study we did was called The Landscape of Educational Technology at Smith College. Um, and we really wanted to unpack that a little bit and sort of develop an understanding of the culture. So the study had three parts. We did a survey of all of our faculty. Um, and we had a pretty good response rate. We had 47% of our faculty respond mm -hmm. across 22 departments. Um, the survey was pretty basic. I'll talk about it in a second. And then we did some focus groups based on the results of the story. And then the other piece of data that informs our work is kind of the participant observation piece, right? The, the work that we do every day with our faculty. So as you see, the, the, when we had faculty respond to the survey, it was, we went innovator, early adopter, mid-adopter, and late adopter. So we kind of blended um, those two categories and we didn't use laggard. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, the, the, our results, those are our results on top, do follow the general trend of the spectrum. Um, responses by division, just give you a few survey responses so you have a baseline understanding before we go into the next um, section of the study. But um, we have, this is so division one is humanities. We have a lot of faculty languages. We work with faculty all the time in languages. I think that's kind of common in liberal arts colleges. Um, our smallest group is the social sciences and then the natural sciences as well. Um, we asked, once people sort of, you know, place themselves along the spectrum, we looked at kind of um, trying to see there's a relationship between division and adoption category. Um, and again, you see that our, um, well, our, like our communities are very well represented there. And then here's just one last slide. Um, we did tools by adoption category. So we asked about the frequency of tool use, but we only asked about tool use that are supported tools at Smith, so very commonly used tools at Smith. Um, and that also kind of went across the spectrum as you can imagine. So the late adopters are using our um, LMS, which is Moodle, and presentation software. And sort of as you move up the spectrum, you get to kind of the more widespread use of different kinds of tools. So there you have it. We could have just stopped there. The tech spectrum works perfectly. Smith is perfectly average. We're done, right? Like that, 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 but that didn't really tell us a whole bunch. Um, so we decided to do some focus groups. And in these focus groups, we really wanted to unpack some of what we were finding. And so I actually started the focus groups, we did them in seven departments. 
with the survey, their department survey results. And I said, like, what do you, what do you make of this? Mm-hmm. And the faculty sat around the table and talked about the results. Um, and so we found some really interesting things. For example, we found that people assume that others are doing more innovative things than they are, so they place themselves lower <laughs> than they really would be. Um, and that's also I kind of the relative, like I think sometimes people have this idea that technology is so, you know, it's like some people can make holograms if they want to in their classroom, so I'm only using <laughs> Moodle, and so I am not an innovator. And so there's all this kind of like people seeing themselves in a relation to others, but, but having a skewed vision of that. Um, and then something that we found really interesting was that people who placed themselves lower um, or maybe a mid adopter uh, and didn't think they were doing something interesting or innovative, technologically speaking, they weren't using sophisticated tools, were actually engaged in really innovative pedagogies. And so what was happening though is they were placing themselves low on the spectrum as well, even though their colleagues thought of them as innovative because what they were had created at the end was really interesting and cool. So this led us to start thinking about how the spectrum was limiting us in a couple of ways. Both it was limiting um, the way our, that the staff at our campus viewed our faculty's potential, if we're sort of putting them in those categories, and it's also limiting faculty's perception of their own potential. So they were sort of placing themselves in those categories. So um, before we get into kind of talking about how all of this informed our framework, Yes, and we'll take you through an activity. Right. So we wanted to do a quick activity, um, and we wanted to look at what's the story here. And given the fact that we just talked about the uh, technology adoption spectrum, we're curious to know what you think as far as um, making up the story to match this photograph. So who is this professor? What is this class? Create the backstory of what's happening here. And we have a minute or so to do this, so it doesn't have to be robust. <laughs> and could technology enhance this experience? And if so, how? This is an actual picture from Smith. Right, right, <laughs> a retired professor. Um, so what I'd like you to do is turn and talk to your neighbor, take about a minute, choose a question, one or more, and discuss what you think the story is in this picture. <laughs> Prescription's bad. <laughs> 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 um, 
and that the kids said, let's have class outside. And he threw up his hands and said, fine, you take the blackboard out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and, and then you had, you had the an uh, well, idea for enhancement. The way that it would enhance technology is, you know, uh, t writing on a smart board or some kind of tablet that captures the animation doesn't really enhance the experience for the people that are sitting there at the moment, but it helps the student when they leave and go home and can't remember how to do the equation, and they can watch it happen again yeah. from the LMS. So it's sort of We're taking a picture and sure. posting it later. Yeah. Right, right, absolutely. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. I mean, I look at the chalkboard as a kind of mobile technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably has wheels. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, I mean, the, the students, it's fantastic. What, five students in the class? <laughs> um, they appear to be all engaged, and it's not clear to me that they're not actually on their tablets or, you know, they're on phones, and that he hasn't instructed them, you know, to do so. So, you know, and, and I think as Laura indicated, there there is a technology that is being used there. Right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to move on since I know we have time constraints. So one of our main findings as we sought to kind of evolve the framework, not only of thinking about the technology adoption spectrum, but as well as the work that we do with faculty and how we relate it. Um, we found that the, the spectrum, it just did not apply to our cultural context at Smith. The number of faculty with whom we collaborate varies, and sometimes we're proactive and sometimes we're reactive, depending on the projects that come before us. Um, and what the study did was it provided us an opportunity to kind of pull back and gain some perspective, challenge our assumptions, and just simply confirm whether we were on the right track. With uh, our respect to our understanding of the spectrum, it also allowed us to disrupt the linear nature of the spectrum and instead evolve and refine our design model, which we're now instead calling a recipe model of technology use. So you pull together pieces that make best sense for any given project at any given time. So in this model, the sophistication of the outcome is a direct result of the combination of the technology and the pedagogy, allowing for a broader range of faculty to be viewed and also viewing themselves as technologically sophisticated, even if and when the tools themselves may not. Um, so for us, it's about innovative and effective teaching and learning first, and then the so we want to disrupt this model in three ways. We want to unlock our faculty potential. And as Deborah mentioned, our work is about challenging our and faculty perception of what innovation actually means, um, both from our view of predisposing us in how we work with faculty, as well as how they pre predispose themselves and their relationship to technology. I myself kind of define myself as a perpetual novice because there's no way to know everything about technology. Things update and change so quickly. And so by thinking of myself as that, it kind of liberates me to make mistakes and to make the learning and the uh, implementation somewhat messy. The next thing that we do is we privilege pedagogy <laughs> over <laughs> <our world. laughs> And at the time I created this, The Force Awakens was out, and I just got caught up in the hype. But I was talking about, okay, who could I put on the slide as a master teacher? And you know, there's so much, oh, what person do you put, male, female? And so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna stick with Yoda. <laughs> um, and so using Yoda as a metaphor and the lightsaber, so the teacher versus the tool. Um, we really do privilege the teacher over the tool. We, per we privilege the, the um, teaching over the bells and whistles that come with technology, and that's kind of the lure and sometimes the sexiness of using technology. Um, so the technology adoption spectrum kind of made this difficult to do. The model as it was originally designed had to do more with tools than actual pedagogy. So we're flipping it as our goal. We start with the pedagogical innovation. You understand that, and you understand that that can happen with a range of tools. Mm -hmm. And in my perfect world, um, we have both Yoda and the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. um, the next is promoting a model of support at risk taking. Um, so presenting ourselves as collaborators rather than tech support coming in to fix a printer. Um, invites our faculty to see us as really co-designers of the learning process and of the actual implementation. And it's an important distinction because 
faculty are better prepared to take risks. Um, we don't often like to say no to faculty, but as a co-collaborator, we can say, uh, this project is w way too big. Why don't you scale it back, do a small piece of it, test that proof of concept, and then launch you know, further improvements and innovation in further semesters. Thank you. Um, so, and we want to uh, make sure that we mitigate risks like such as technology failing or loss of seat time, etc. So we are going to talk about this particular um, document in the next session, but we do want to present some examples in our last five minutes. Yeah, I just want to um, talk to you about a couple of use cases. Um, so this is one of my <coughs> favorite um, stories, and this is now a project that's a, a couple of years old, but this professor who um, created this project at the time, I think now thinks for herself more innovative, really did not think for herself as an innovative user. Um, it was a French professor, and this is a French intensive writing course, um, and basically it became an online role play. And the idea itself um, was not hers in terms of, um, the online piece was hers. So this is a sort of tried and true uh, pedagogical technique, which students, it was during, uh, students would study the period of time during occupied World War II in France, and they all lived in an apartment building, and each student picked a different floor of the apartment building, and they picked a character that they would be. And they would, be a right to each other in French every week based on things that were unfolding in the course itself. Um, and then they, you know, their politics, politics would change based on kind of how they were interacting, what was unfolding. Um, and it was really fascinating when they came to class, they had to speak with other characters in, in character based on kind of what had transpired in this online space before. Um, so this is an example, and it's all done of work. Very basic. Students were basically, you know, journaling, um, and so it was an example of something that I found really pedagogically innovative and very successful, just using a very basic tool. Um, and this is another one that we recently did, um, where the tool was also basic, but it became a really interesting project. Um, this is, uh, it was English class, but this particular artifact is a rare book that was just required by Smith, acquired by Smith, um, and it's a uh, collection of poems by Swinburne, but the person who put together and illustrated the, the book, and it's this beautiful, incredible collection, is unknown. We don't know who that person is. So all of the pages were scanned and, and into um, a digital space and then um, put into WordPress. But what we did with, and then there were certain tools, like we had a magnifying tool so you could really examine the pages closely, but the whole idea of it for the students was they created this whole kind of story of mystery and this and trying to discover who the illustrator was based on the details of the illustrations. And then it sort of the idea is to also become a crowdsourcing tool because they're going to put it out there and then other people can comment on it and try to figure out if, you know, is this really from the Victorian period? Oh, this, I saw this drawing somewhere else. <coughs> and so again, it was kind of this very basic tool. It was just digitizing this book into WordPress and it became this really rich pedagogical experience for the students. Where are we? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So this next example is um, from East Asian languages, specifically sort of Yaolin Chen, who's a, on the faculty at Smith in the audience. And Yaolin came to me originally because she uh, teaches, uh, this is for an intensive Chinese uh, 110 class. And she had the need to, as her students were learning how to write Mandarin characters, be able to display that on an iPad in front of the class versus just kind of using the whiteboards. Mm -hmm. And so we um, matched her up with an iPad and showed her this tool called Explain Everything, which if you don't know it, it's really a wonder tool and it's worth exploring. <coughs> um, but it's a, a, a rich multimedia kind of screencasting tool that allowed her to do the task that she originally set out to do. But what she quickly discovered because she is an innovator in our space, um, that once we provided her with the background of what the educational kind of tool is that matches kind of her pedagogical goals, she then kind of ran with it. And, and plug for the next session, um, she's presenting with Sujane Wu, also on the faculty at Smith, the evolution of this project from just something where she was using originally to display characters, and then also help to kind of reinforce students' misconceptions post-class by creating videos that then evolved into a space where students were creating these videos for themselves to a much bigger project. So um, I don't know how much time we have. 
one minute? Okay, I think the video is about one minute. So if you want to This is the character Ling that I want to introduce to the class. The structure for this character is left and right. Here is the stroke order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. The radical is Jin, meaning gold. This character, Ming, means bell. Just like my <coughs> Japanese name, Suzu. My Japanese name, Suzu, does not really have a specific character. These two characters can be read Suzu in Japanese. However, I did not want to use this one just because this one looked prettier. <laughs> and just a fun fact, what sound does a bell make? In Japanese, it's ding ding. And well, that became my brother's name, Rin. You can already see the hierarchy between siblings here. Well, that's a thing. So that was an example of um, once that project had, had, had evolved and Yaleen did much of this work and modeled it for her students that the students actually took it on and started producing uh, their own work as well. So I think that's it, ready? Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Had a contact us. <laughs>